I've got another Geometry Dash tool for you guys. For those of you who play on Absolute's 1.9 private server, or really any other private server for that matter, you've probably experienced having to download songs that you know you already have saved in regular Geometry Dash. If you're like me, you probably realize just how wasteful this is, both because you have to wait to download the song again, and because you now have two copies of the song on your hard drive instead of just one. And that is why I created a tool to synchronize music between two different installations of GDE without using any additional disk space. Let me show you the tool in action. Here I have a client for the 1.9 private server running. Now if I start the level, you can see that when I crash, I do have audio. But I don't have any music. To correct this, I can go back to the main page, and then without closing GDE, I can run my tool. And it's already done synchronizing, so I'll zoom in so that we can take a look at the output. Here you can see the songs that have gone from GD to the Geometry Dash private server, and the songs that have gone the other way around. Now I can just close this, click on play on the level, and already we have music. Now, at this point you probably have a couple of questions. One of them might be, well that's not Windows, is it? That's correct. This is Linux with a KDE desktop environment. My tool works on both Linux and Windows, so you'll be able to use it on either platform. As for the other question, you might be thinking, no, my program does not make copies of the music files. It's actually much smarter than that. But to explain how, we need to do a crash course on link files. Before diving in, it's helpful to conceptualize the data stored on your drive as being in two layers. The bottom layer, shown here in red, represents the bits of files written on your drive. The upper layer, shown in blue, represents the file system, which is the database that translates the continuous sequence of ones and zeros on the drive into the hierarchical structure of folders that we're accustomed to navigating. Now, most Windows users are familiar with shortcut files. These are convenient little files that point to other files or programs that you can create to make navigating in File Explorer a little bit easier. These shortcut files actually do have a file extension, LNK, but Windows hides it from you even if you tell File Explorer to show file extensions. Anyway, these shortcut files are actually data written to the disk that then point to some other location on the file system. In this diagram, the shortcut file has an entry on the file system, is written to the disk, and then the data on the disk points to the location on the file system where the file resides. If you open a shortcut file with a text editor, you will find that it's mostly just gibberish, but there will be some text that looks like a file system path. This gibberish is binary, meaning it's only readable to a computer, while the file system path necessarily must be text so we can still pick it out and read it. Linux has a similar type of file called a link file, and it uses the desktop entry standard to organize its data. It's much cleaner and easier to understand and work with. Both shortcut and link files are great for file managers that help you navigate around your file system, but because they actually contain their own data, programs will treat these files as their own things rather than the files that they point to. Now for the next type of link file, the symbolic link. A symbolic link, or symlink for short, is file system metadata that points to another location on the file system. Because a symlink has no data of its own, a program that is given a symlink will treat it like the file that the symlink points to. However, just like with a shortcut file, a symbolic link can be broken if the file it points to is moved or deleted. You might not have experienced this on Windows though, because Windows tries to intelligently fix broken shortcuts using file history. And this brings us to the final type of link file, the hard link. A hard link is another piece of metadata in the file system that points directly to the place on the drive that has the data. In fact, there is no difference between a hard link and the original file. Both refer to the same data in exactly the same way, just from different locations on the logical file system. So a depiction like this would be more accurate as both the original file and the hard link are equals. As a result, either the hard link or the original file can be deleted without impacting the other. The file is only deleted when nothing points to it anymore, although it can still be recovered with data recovery software that looks at the raw disk rather than the file system. Also, if you modify a file at one of its hard links, then those changes will be present if you access the file through a different hard link. So to go back to the music synchronization program, the tool uses hard links, so the data itself is not copied, and you also won't have to worry about breaking symbolic links if you ever clean up any of your songs. I should mention though that file management software might not be able to tell when a file has an additional hard link pointing to it, so it might look like you're using up twice as much disk space for the music files even though each file is only on the disk in one place. 
So that brings us to the part of the video where we talk about how to set up my synchronization tool. I actually won't cover the installation as the tool comes with instructions. Instead what I'll do is go over how to compute a checksum for the download as you do want to make sure that you don't download a copy of the software that has been tampered with. To check a checksum you want to open up a terminal and then we'll zoom in here so that we can see what we're doing and then you need to navigate to the folder that contains the downloaded file. Whether you're on Windows or Linux you'll use the cd command to do this. Then, on the Windows command prompt, that is not PowerShell, you'll type in cert util forward slash hash file, followed by the name of the file, and then SHA-512. And then you just press enter and you get your output. Now, right now I'm on Linux, so we're going to do this using the Linux command, and that command is SHA-512-SUM, followed by the name of the file. We'll press enter and get our output, and it should be very quick. This exact string here is the SHA-512 hash of the zip file. So if this string that you see here on the video matches the one that you got when you ran the command, then you can be reasonably confident that the zip file and its contents have not been tampered with. If the string is different, then the zip file that you downloaded is different from the one that I have here. And with that, you should be good to go. Now the license that I chose for the software is unlicensed, which effectively puts the software in the public domain. Therefore, you can do whatever you want with it. I hope you find it useful.